Hello and welcome. My name is Jacqueline Sundberg and I work with Aurora Group here at the McGill Library. That's Rare Books and Special Collections, Othosler Library, the Visual Arts Collection, and Archives and Records Management. We welcome speakers from McGill, Montreal, and beyond. And today, our guest brings us all a welcome taste of Southern Sun. Author Nancy Springer is joining us from Florida. Thanks to Nancy and to all of you for joining us. Just an idea of what's coming. We have an introduction to some of our mysteries at Roar with librarian Chris Lyons. The main portion of the event is gonna be a conversation with Natalie Cook and Nancy Springer. And we will follow that by a Q and A where all of you get to ask your questions to Nancy and Natalie. And if you have any questions specifically for Roar librarians, we are always happy to answer questions. Before I do go further, this is a virtual event and we're happy to welcome all of you. But it is a fact that it's due to COVID-19 restrictions that we are all joining you from home. So we're delighted to be able to welcome you from wherever you are. But I wanna take a moment and acknowledge um, the place that sort of brings us all together. And that's McGill University. And it's located on land that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Roar and the McGill Library honors and recognizes and respects the nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which McGill stands and on which its community meets today. While we're all tuning in from diverse places, including Florida, um, this virtual format does let us continue to meet and connect over ideas. And for that, I'm very grateful. So on that note, let me introduce Chris Lyons. He is the head of Rare Books and Special Collections. And he's going to start off today with a few ways that you can explore Conan Doyle, Holmes, and mysteries more generally at Roar. So on that note, I will reshare screen and pass it over to you, Chris. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, depending on where you are or when you watch this. I'm delighted to be here with you. As uh, my colleague Jacqueline said, I'm director of Rare Books and Special Collections, which is one of the Roar units. And I wanted to tell you a bit about our uh, Conan Doyle collection and maybe a couple of related things that you might find interesting. And for those of you who are Holmesians or Baker Street irregulars, I've got a couple of mysteries for you. One I can solve, the other ones I hope you can help me solve. But let's start looking at some of what we have. Now, McGill collectively is not a big Holmesian um, uh, repository. You know, Toronto Public Library has got a wonderful collection, and you know about it, but we do have a couple of caches and they're interesting ones. Um, a lot of uh, first editions, I'm happy to say. So if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll just show you some of them. So we have some very attractive um, editions there. If we go to the next slide, you'll see a couple more, very attractive. These are all in the rare books and special collections. And then we have, and we'll stop there for a second. Um, I see Beth Rue Nagan raised her hand. I don't know if um, anyone's taking care of the comments, um, but I'll go on with my talk. And uh, here's, here's my mystery. And this is the one I can't solve for you. And th that is, I'm, I'm gonna have to step back a bit. And uh, McGill, of course, is over 200 years old. And a lot of our collection initially started out as our circulating collection or our academic collection, which then by the virtue of age has become a rare collection. Um, this is not an example of it. Now, I'm not gonna be snobbish, but probably when these were originally published in the late 19th and early 20th century, chances are McGill was not collecting them because it wouldn't have fit into the academic program. So the question I asked myself when I started founding these is, why do we have these books and when did we get them? So in this case, I discovered that six of the 11 books we have in Rare Books and Special Collections by Conan Doyle have this book plate. So this book belongs to Andrew A. Miller. So it's an interesting one, quite a charming um, uh, label, or if you can read it. And, uh, but it's not an institutional label. If we go to the next slide, please. You can see these are the books that he has, he has given. He are the books that he owned. We, can, we can't say they gave them to us or not. Here, here's another clue. You can see on the bottom of the spine, so that's the right-hand side, there were shelf marks there or call numbers. They have been removed. So if we go to the next one, next slide, you can see, and oh, if you just go back one first, please. Okay, so now we're gonna start getting into some clues. From what we can tell, we probably got these in the 1940s. 
Now, those of you who are Montrealers of a certain age, as they say, you can see on the left um, price tags, and the price tags for Morgan's. Now, Morgan's is now the bay. So that means that they were purchased sometimes before the, I think, 1960s or 70s. If we go to the next one, next slide, please. You can see this, this, this copy has been purchased at a bookseller, at least at some point. In, the, in Bristol, so British bookseller. So if we go to the next one, please. Now, not all our books come from the same collection by Andrew E. Miller. Some of them are ones that we received, as you can see here. They are a gift from uh, Miss Grace Cassells, and it was originally a Christmas gift. So seasonally um, interesting one there, which we acquired at some point. So, my guess, now here we go, is that we, this collection is something that was growing out of an actual desire to collect these as rare material. Some of them came from a single collector, whether it came directly from the collector or it came via uh, an intermediary bookseller or something like that is another question. I have no idea who this man is. So I'm wondering if anyone in the, um, Sherlock Holmes or Conan Doyle universe knows who Andrew A. Miller is or was, and if he was a Montrealer or not, that would be great. My guess is these were acquired when McGill was starting to really develop its rare book collection, probably circa 1950. That I do that from accession number. Our second cache of books, if we go forward, please. Another one is from this man. Now here's a mystery I can explain to you, but a mystery it is. This is Sir William Osler. And if you don't know who Sir William Osler is, shame on you. Anyway, whoops, there he is. Sir William Osler at one point was perhaps the greatest or the best known uh, physician in the, in the Anglo-American world. He was a Canadian born McGill trained uh, physician who went off to found the John Hopkins Medical School, which you've been hearing about a lot in terms of the current public health issues and then was Regis Professor of Medicine, was knighted in 1911 between Sir William Osler. In addition to being a great physician, he was a great bibliophile. And he collected a book of about 8,000 books, which he thought were really important in the history of medicine science. And he donated them to McGill in, uh, at, on his death in 1919. If we go to the next slide, please. It's a catalog of this. And in amongst these books, his books, are about 11 titles of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is the catalog itself. There you can see some of the titles up to number uh, 4755. And you say to yourself, why? What does Doyle, Conan Doyle have to do with medicine? And why would someone like Osler be collecting it? Well, Osler divided his collection into various areas. And the idea was he wanted people to read, have a good sense of developing a totality of an understanding of medicine. So one of the sections, um, primus, the prima, the first section was the greatest, you know, known physicians and people in medicine. So it's Florence Nightingale and um, Escapolis and everyone else in between. And, but one of the sections is the literaria. Literaria he described as bad books written by good doctors and good books written by bad doctors. And that was, I think, the category he put Conan Doyle in, because Conan Doyle trained in medicine, and Conan Doyle based Sherlock Holmes on his training in medicine. Now, we'll go to the next slide. And this is the connection between Holmes and 19th century medicine. This is Sir William Osler practicing a very, what you might think of as a Holmesian thing, which is observation. So think of it, 19th century, it's very difficult to see inside a body, particularly a living body. So the only way you know you know what's going on inside of someone without them dropping dead and you autopsizing them, if that's a verb, well, it is now, um, would be through observation. So you would observe the patient, and that's what you see him doing circa 1900 at Johns Hopkins. You'd listen, you palpitate, you touch, and that's how you knew what was going on. Take those skills, so diagnostic skills that doctors needed to be able to diagnose and then help their patients and then just use it to solve crime as opposed to solve disease and you've got Sherlock Holmes. Now, 
in addition to our two caches of information, we go to the next slide. I want to give you a sense of related information now, because that's the thing McGill very much has a wonderful collection of Victoriana, if you want to call it that, I mean, early 20th century material. Why? Because we are around forever, had great libraries for 200 years. Not only that, we had the good sense and we continue to have the good sense not to toss the stuff out. So we've got these wonderful collections of books, which were contemporary books, which now for people who are interested in this era, have a wonderful first person or, or primary um, view into this world. So in this case, as you can see, um, this is General Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, writing about poverty in England, particularly London, a lot of things. So, so the atmosphere you read in the Sherlock Holmes books, you get out of this material. So this primary material, or go on one more, next slide, <laughs> legal material. And this, this is, this is such a British thing. Okay, so it's, it's this is a, a hideous cover, <laughs> but Trials of Oscar Wilde. You, know, you can't quite see it at the top, but this is part of a series called. Um, oh, oh, thank you, thank you. I, I get, someone's helping me with the the thing. So you see the comment. Andrew A. Miller died in 1953 in a township. So we might have it might have been a donation, a posthumous donation. Thank you for that. Anyway, so there's a series called Notable British Trials. They're trial transcripts, and there, there's about a hundred. There's if that's not enough for you, there's even notable Scottish trials. And there was even an attempt to do notable Canadian trials. I think there's one volume. Anyway, this is not a rare collection. This is a collection, the the, the Nova in the law library. But we have all this material in Jewish jurisprudence, in medical forensics, in all these different areas. So if you ever wanted to just wallow in the world of Sherlock Holmes or that era, we've got a lot of material. Uh, not all of it's cataloged. And as you know, with COVID, we're not open to public and researching, but you're always welcome uh, to get in touch with us and then come and explore our collections because we're a public institution and we always welcome and in fact, enthusiastically um, would like to help you find these great treasures. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I think what he's given us is a good foundation for a further exploration of the era of Sherlock Holmes and the things that grew out of it, which is what we're gonna be talking about with Nancy and Natalie. So let me introduce both Nancy Springer and Natalie Cook, who are gonna be having a conversation shortly. I'll start with Natalie. She's a professor of English here at McGill. And since 2016, she has helmed Rohr as the Associate Dean of the Special Collections Units here at the McGill Library. In that time, her research interests have bridged the realms of English studies, digital humanities, and special collections research. Her areas of research and interest now include food history and food writing, so appropriate given her surname of Cook and have in the past few years taken a turn into the curious fields of riddles and genres of cryptic communication in particular, including enigmatic bills of fare and more recently, menus. She's the lead investigator on a Shirk Insight Development Grant, which is called Food for Thought, as well as a new project that launched in 2021, Ciphers of the Times. She's currently curating an exhibition of riddles and riddling ways that we will be installing in the library in February in the hopes that our building will be open and we will be able to invite you all to come see it. At the moment, as Chris mentioned, our building is closed to the public through January 24th, but you're welcome to send us email inquiries about the collections and about visiting and exploring what we have in the holdings and exploring the world of Sherlock and of course, Enola Holmes. So on that note, I'll introduce Nancy. She started writing at the age of 22, and she has now celebrated a golden milestone as an author. She's written over 50 novels. Her works include seven books of the Enola Holmes series on which a recent Netflix film was based. And she writes in mythic fantasy, contemporary fiction, magic realism and mystery, juvenile literature and more. Her works open doors to the realms of adventure and discovery. And her books have been nominated for awards in many different genres and categories. While many now know of her creative talents through the character of Enola Holmes, Sherlock Holmes' fictitious younger sister, um, she considers her best work to be I Am Mordred, A Tale of Camelot, and I Am Morgan Le Fay, two books of Arthurian legends. Her most recent book came out this past year, Enola Holmes and the Black Barouche, and it's the seventh book in the Enola series. 
and where it picks up with the precocious, intelligent, and fiercely independent Enola Holmes, the much younger sister, as we mentioned, of Sherlock Holmes. Enola is a purgatorian, which is a great word that I hope Nancy will explain to all of us. <laughs> a finder of lost things is the short definition. And in this final or the seventh installation of the Enola series, she's now made her peace with her older brother, Sherlock. So Enola's adventures in this latest story, as in each of Nancy's books, bring the word art into a world filled with codes, ciphers, puzzles, and problems. They also provide a unique and fascinating perspective into female life in the Victorian period. I look forward to hearing about the creation of these works today. So apologies for the background noise. This is working from home and my husband is teaching a class in the next room. So I'm going to mute myself right away and you pass the microphone to Nancy and Natalie, who I'm gonna spotlight for everyone. Over to you. Thanks so much, Jacqueline, for the introduction. And I'm so excited to be here. Um, Nancy, the audience is from many different places. Um, and I noticed that we have a number of different publics in the room, so to speak. I, there are costume designers here. There are members of my research team who are interested in agony as during the Victorian period and cryptic communications. Um, and there are also a number of people who come to us from the Westmont Public Library because they were so excited to hear that you were coming. And there were lots of fans who wanted to come and hear what you had to say. It, at the McGill Research Library, by the way, your books are um, incredibly popular, often as audible books, as well as um, written books. So in lots of different formats. So let me kick it off with a question about the Enola Holmes books. You've written seven of them so far. And you've spent a lot of time researching Victorian culture, codes, and cryptic communications. I'm wondering how your perception of the Victorian period has evolved or changed since you began. Actually, I don't think it did evolve or change much. I was very familiar with Victorian literature from a young age. Uh, there was a lot of it around my parents' house. And I, as I was an English lit major, I, I studied a lot of Victorian literature, and I tended to read Victorian literature. And I think mm. I was pretty much brought up by a Victorian morality. Uh, <laughs> I even remember wearing gloves to church and a hat. Yeah. So it, it, I don't think uh, the, uh, the research certainly educated me and filled in a lot of, a lot of uh, detail. But I, I think right from the get go, I, I sort of am a Victorian. <laughs> um, there was a hi hiatus in the series between, I guess it was 2010 and 2021, when the most recent book appeared. Um, in what way did the structure of the novels change during that period? Or maybe you can tell us a bit about that hiatus. Okay. Um, when I did all that uh, um, original research about Enola Holmes back in uh, the early 21st century, or mm. maybe it was the late 20th, uh, I thought that I would write many, many Enola Holmes books because when you do a ton, a ton and a half of research, you want to make the most product or yeah, income yeah. out of it that you possibly can. But Enola Dratter, she insisted on having her character arc and she insisted on getting to know her brothers and she insisted on having closure and I ended up with six books. And I thought that was it. And I was actually pretty stubborn about that being it until Sometime after the recession of 2008, my income was drastically reduced and I was struggling. And I decided, okay, I'll try writing a few more Enola Holmes books. So The Black Baruch mm -hmm. was actually written maybe oh, back in 2010, you know, almost oh, 20 wow. years ago. Yeah. yeah, but it didn't sell because things were at a low at that time. My agent, literary agent, very sensibly, simply kept hold of it until after the movie. And then it made muchos. Yeah, it sold quite well. 
And there is another one forthcoming uh, this year, this year, I forget it's 2022. Um, it's called Enola Holmes and the Elegant Escapade. And it will be coming out. When will it be coming out? I have a note here somewhere. I forget whether it's August or September. Right, but, we'll look for it. Yeah. And of course, so, the, yes. the, Nef the Netflix film was incredibly popular, so that helped as well. But yes. the other part of it was nobody could have foreseen COVID and, and the fact that Netflix became just so yeah. fundamental, to, you know. The whole thing is close to miraculous. It's, uh, it's like the stars aligned because this kid, I think she was maybe 12 years old at the time, uh, Paige Brown, her older sister, was maybe uh, maybe 13 or 14. And she said, Millie, you're going to like these books. Read them. So this child read wow. my Enola Holmes books. And she was, by way of becoming a movie star or a, a TV star, a Hollywood star, and she had enough clout to say, I want to make a movie out of these. A kid. Now, yeah. all my... Most of my professional life, my main audience has been children, even when I was writing for adults, when I was writing fantasy, uh, a lot of those books were read by teenagers. And then, of course, I segued over into uh, children's lit and young adult literature. And I've always been an advocate for youth. I've always been an advocate for those who, who really don't have much of a voice up until they reach their majority. And so it was a full circle, sort of a karma thing that uh, young Millie Bobby Brown made my life a whole heck of a lot easier when I had been writing in not exactly po poverty, but pretty close to it for most of my life. That's an amazing story. And it, it's wonderful, too, that you started out by talking about how strong a character Enola was. That, that she, to a certain extent, shaped the arc of the fiction as well. Well, you see, when I was a child, I read the entire Sherlock Holmes. Actually, my mother had the entire Conan Doyle in a 10 book series. And I read all of it repeatedly until I had memorized all the Sherlock Holmes stories. And I remember when I was 12 or thereabouts, just being heartbroken because there were no more. Mm. But my main peeve with Sherlock Holmes, even back then, even as a child, was he didn't appreciate women. And there came a time when he needed to be shown. And I was, <laughs> I was a kid sister <laughs> to two older brothers. So I knew how to do this. I knew the function of a kid sister. And, and the rest, you know all the rest. I'm going to switch to a question that you shouldn't ask an author, and I know this, but you have mentioned that Enola is in a way you, and you've, and you've just alluded to the fact that you have no, you know, an older sibling and that there's a certain sampa between the two of you. Can you describe ways in which you see yourself in Enola and vice versa? You know, obviously I'm thinking that modern day Florida is a very <laughs> different world to Victorian England. Well, as uh, are expectations of women and how forceful women can be. Yes. Well, that likeness, which I didn't actually realize until I was handing in the first one, the first manuscript, I got butterflies. I'm like, uh, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is way too much about me. That's mostly about the dis the distant mother, and the child oh, who is okay. alone and has no friends. And that's that's pretty much the the. A, a, my mother was not like Enola's mother, but my mother was a distant mother. She didn't tuck me into bed. I don't recall her ever telling me she loved me, not once. Uh, she hugged seldom. My father was also distant, but this is about the mother. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, a very much of a misfit loner child. Uh, I was bullied. And uh, so that, that's it. That's where it is. It's about her loneliness. It's about her, Enola's loneliness is my loneliness. And I'm still lonely. And uh, I'm still a, a misfit in this world. People don't know how to talk to uh, somebody who stays home and writes books. <laughs> but I, 
I think a lot of readers can sympathize. I mean, you've got a lot of yes. fans in this audience, yes. right? And especially yes. during COVID, you know, which was one of the most isolating experiences I think that many of us have had. So it's interesting that there's very much a community that, that engages with that. Yes, and, and writers. If, if take a writer and what you have is a weird little kid who turned into a writer. This is almost universal. So, and, and uh, I was, COVID was not that big of a change for me. I was very well suited to COVID. I but, think a number of, of our community have mentioned that. They've said that they're readers and it was actually uh, became a real gift during COVID. Yes. You know, to be oh, able yeah. to enjoy books and the community of the book clubs. We've actually held a lot of book clubs and it, it, it was heartening, the kind of community, right? Um, you say that Enola doesn't identify herself as a detective, um, but rather as a perditorian, which is lovely. And this is a term that she comes up with in the case of the missing Marquis, when she meets the astral perditorian, Madame Leila Sybil de Papaver in that book, you know. Can yes. you talk a little bit about that moniker and why you decided to make her a perditorian as opposed to a detective, let's say, and how that will help with the evolution of her character? Well, this has a lot to do with my early on, up, up, until, uh, up until I won the Oscar award a couple of times, I kept saying I would never write mystery because mysteries are full of murders and I don't like murders. And I don't appreciate the first corpse, the second corpse, or any of the subsequent corpses. And the only type of mystery I liked is missing person mystery, where you find people and behold, they are alive. So uh, I didn't want Enola to be a murder mystery detective. I invented the word yeah. purgatorian, finder of missing persons and things, there was a, a Victorian name, Perdita, which meant the lost one. Uh, another Victorian name of Oscar Wilde's sister's name was Isola, the isolated one. Oh, okay. And of course, the name Enola was a genuine Victorian women's name, alone. And of course, having been a lonely person or identifying as a lonely person, so to speak, I, that had to be her name. I knew it as soon as I conceived of the character that that was her name. And did I answer your question? Absolutely, you did. Uh -huh. you, gave it, you gave us a, a short answer and then you gave us the story around it, which is terrific. Um, I want to delve a bit more into your, your notion of feminine knowledge of the Victorian period. You know, the more we read the Enola books, the more we we understand there's a, um, a, a kind of language that Enola can speak that Mycroft and Sherlock can't. She yeah. has access to, access to a wonderful privileged notion of knowledge. And I'm particularly interested for the costume designers in the audience here, because you, you treat us to codes on, you know, embroidered on ribbon or, and very, very detailed discussions of um, the different dresses and the different things that women are wearing. And we are um, invited to, to pay attention to those subtle um, codes and uh, messages that have been communicated by what's being worn and how that works. Can you talk a bit about feminine knowledge and how that's a privileged area for Enola and for the way you develop these novels? Well, what, what I've come to realize is that in uh, being a woman in the Victorian age meant being a part of a female conspiracy against men or under the noses of men or in concealment from men. It's, it's being a woman is still a lot like that. I have a whole bunch of friends that I talk to them on the telephone and we talk to each other about our husbands. And then one of, the, one of them will say, oh, my husband's on his way in and we change the conversation. <laughs> being, being Been there, a, done that. Yes, be, being a woman is it being in a conspiracy and communicating at a level that men either cannot or will not understand, and being smart in a way that men are often stupid, and acting stupid when the men think they're smart, and all of the codes, the 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 
flowers, the, the sealing wax, the, uh, oh, there was a, a code of glove buttons. How many buttons do your gloves have? Um, so many codes, I can't even think of them. Uh, how you drop your handkerchief and what it means. And of course, uh, many of the young men in the, in the act of courting became a little bit cognizant of these codes, but Sherlock, as far as we know, never courted anybody. Similarly, Mycroft never courted anyone. So they simply were unaware of what Enola knew and could do. And in a way, she herself was unaware of it until she started to act out and gain confidence and have agency. That's what that's the, the code word these days, agency. The uh, code words change from time to time. And so, in fact, in, in the very early novel, she doesn't understand what the, uh, the bustle enhancer is or quite how, you know, um, constrictive the corsets were. So that's, that's an interesting line you have to balance between um, you're inviting readers into the Victorian world and it's a kind of immersive experience. And yet for your young adult audiences, especially, but also for others, you're also having to provide enough information so they understand the implications of what living like a Victorian actually feels like. So, I mean, the, the spoon the corsets is, is oh, an interesting things, example. Those things were dreadful. But, and what they did to the girls at the so-called boarding schools or finishing schools was, was dreadful. But Enola was a, a rebel right from the get-go. She's like, okay, if I'm gonna wear, she figured out that how her mother fled was by packing her bustle full of baggage and also her uh, rather oddly shaped hat. And uh, every time I researched a deal, uh, I'm sorry, a detail of Victorian costume, I was thinking, how can I use this? How could Enola use this? Because almost everything uh, can be subverted. You can put a poison dart in a parasol. Um, I did, there's just so many possibilities because of the complexity of the costume. Your, uh, your wealthy Victorian woman was typically wearing about 25 pounds of clothing. Wow. And yeah. what, the, uh, wow. what, what the dress reformers were trying to do was get that down to eight pounds. Now, how many pounds of clothing do you feel that you and I are wearing right now? Nowhere near eight pounds. So it, 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 was, uh, it was like armor plating and it could be used for defense, armament and uh, supplies. <laughs> it was, you were a tank or a battleship. Absolutely. They often, yes, they often compared women to ships sailing over the, uh, the, the marble floor or whatever. And it's an apt title. And referring to that, you make an interesting um, decision that you actually incorporate Florence Nightingale in one of the novels. So as well as having a fictitious character, you, you incorporate this you know, a historical character and reference the Crimean War, which is interesting. Can you tell me a little bit about that decision? That was an interesting one. Well, I'm trying to remember how that happened. Um, I suppose I must have stumbled across Florence Nightingale and gotten very interested in her. Uh, and she was, of course, a, a leading and exemplary member of the, the revolution. When she said, I'm going to go nurse these soldiers the way they are going to be, they deserve to be nursed, mm. all of the army generals and army everything was against her. Every, everybody except the soldiers themselves were against her. They didn't, yeah. Want, yeah. they didn't want her messing up their good times. They were, they were having a great war. It's just that these other people were dying, you know, these, these mere privates. And the surgeons didn't want to even come into the wards because they would catch fever. I forget what kind of mm -hmm. fever, Crimean fever. That's so, right. Yes, uh, I'm proud of having made up that particular code. There were a number, I've actually got a list of them here. Uh, most of my codes came from this darling little book. Can you see it? Wait, there it is. Yes. At, which is easily obtained at doverpublications.com. 
but uh, I've, and the reason the codes ended up in the books was because I had to do that in the first book so that mother could communicate with Enola after mother was gone. It was simply a matter of necessity. And I thought that would be it, but no, my, af thereafter, my editors insisted on a code in each book. And I was not happy about that because like Enola, I was not a fan of codes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, she says that. Yes, however, I did make up the Ivy code uh myself and the the dogwood iris apples codes and the asparagus thing that's for me and the uh my favorite code is the pig pen code which was actually introduced by the masons oh was uh, it the freemasons yes and then of course the turning morse code into embroidery on the ribbons on a crinoline one of my best moments that was that was brilliant. Also putting it on a crinoline because it was obvious that it would be private. Yes. And so while the dress is something that could be visible publicly, yes. the crinoline was yes. private. That was a wonderful moment. And who the heck embroiders ribbon? I mean, really. <laughs> Florence Nightingale, it turns out. And in fact, a number, a number of people on our staff are very crafty and they were developing this exhibition. You can see Jacqueline smile here. There were a couple of people who said, ooh, maybe we could actually do a little bit of embroidery on a ribbon and put it in the exhibition case and do a version Beautiful. of that. I love that. So you said something very interesting. You've said that sometimes you start um, developing ideas through playing. Oh, of course. And obviously, um, one of the reasons we invited you this particular year is because we are programming um, a series of talks and events around play. And so we're particularly interested in play and puzzles and those kinds of things. Can you talk a little bit about how play enters into your writerly world? Okay, so this is my vocabulary notebook that I have been keeping since forever. But in the back of it on the last three pages, I have word collections. Word collection number one is words that are like dodo, lula, lulu, dick, dick, ta, ta, tur, tutu, tt, okay. And here's a bunch of words that are like hip hop, tip top, teeter totter, rick rack, tic tac, knick knack. And here's another word collection that is words like boo hoo, willy nilly, pee wee, tp, voodoo, phoebe. Now, why am I doing this? What's the use of this? I'm playing. There's no other logical or illogical reason to be keeping word collections. Similarly, I collect, uh, I used to collect bumper stickers. My mm -hmm. all time favorite bumper sticker was proudly marching to the beat of a different kettle of fish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Not I to also, mix a metaphor. Yes, loved it. Uh, my husband, who is Chilean, has simply never gotten it. He's like, I just don't get it. Um, yeah, but some things, uh, cultural change, language change, you just don't get them. And I also collect toys. Hold on a minute. There is no particular reason for me to have brought this thing home from a yard sale. <laughs> but there it is. It's right here in my office where I can frequently play with it. And I don't know if you noticed, but a smaller ball just fell out of it and rolled away. Uh, that's I, what I mean, that's what we're finding in this this year of programming about play is that we learn through playing. It's really embodied knowledge. Colored pens. I don't want to write with plain old pens. I've got colored pens. Oh, yeah. Do you write in longhand? Sometimes poetry and such or uh, uh, research outlines. Oh, yes, I must show you this. This is the original Enola Bible. And this again came from a thrift shop. And let's see, uh, we cut pictures. That's Queen Victoria, I believe. We have stickers. Uh, when it came to some of the pages have drawings. Uh, there's another sticker collection. Uh, I'm looking for the page of horses. Oh, well, just everything I could put in here. 
kind of like scrapbooking. There's some more. Um, right. And the rest of it is all my notes. When it, I used the sticker, but this is totally hodgepodge. So to some degree, I used the stickers to label things on the language of flowers page. I have flowers and uh, on the kinds of carriages page, I have a big sticker of a horse, but I can't find it right now and I won't waste your time. One okay. day, a rare collections, a person from rare collections and archives is going to approach you and say, Ooh, yeah. one, one day this thing will come up to auction and this, oh, that's where I am right now. So you can see, I only have a few pages left. I'm, I'm working on another book, Enola. Okay. And this Look. is, these are my current notes, purple and green, I think. No, purple and turquoise. So let, and us, let us know when the time comes. I, I, okay. have no, I have no idea whether it will be any good, but let's hope it is. So we have, I, I know time is running out because I want to be able to open this up to other people for questions. Yes. So I, I just have two questions left. The first is because of my own research interests in the um, agony ads of Victorian newspapers. Oh yes. I noticed that Enola and her mom seem to prefer the Pell-Mell Gazette, you know, um, although she does advertise in the Times and other newspapers. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the different newspapers of the period and what you know about them and their readership? Honestly, I don't know much. I simply know that the Pell-Mell Gazette was preferred by women. It was a little bit more feminist than, than say, the London Times. Okay. And then, and as um, fans of the Netflix film, we have to ask you, when you, we, we know that you knew what was going to be coming in the film, but once you actually saw it, were there any surprises? Were there any, um, there are some discrepancies between the, the film and the novel in terms of, let's say, Enola's age, for example, or a few of those small discrepancies. Can you tell us if you noticed anything that caught your attention? The most delightful thing was those little lithographic figures that would pop up. Yeah. And, and all that was a total surprise to me, all, all the fun things they did. Uh, that were not actually movie, but sort of little interruptions to movie. Uh, they were darling. Uh, I was slightly annoyed that they, they were always and forever dressing Enola as a boy, because her credo was she would mm. never dress as a boy. She would, uh, that was a cliche, but they needed the cliche. It was a movie. They didn't tell it. They didn't have time to uh, figure out all the, the details of bustles and all the rest of it. So they dressed her as a boy. Uh, other, I was delighted by the movie as a whole. I had very little to complain about. Not, actually, I think I've already complained about it. So there we are. And the very last question, because we, we enjoyed the movie. I, we hear there's probably another one coming out. There is. When? Uh, probably late this year, uh, fil filming just wrapped like last week. Of the, the actual filming. So we so, look forward to that as well as to the next book. So thank you so much for joining us. This has been a real pleasure. So I'm going to hand it back to Jacqueline, who can um, lead the open things up to the audience for questions. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks, Natalie. So yes, as Natalie said, we'll open it up for questions. If you have them, please put them in the chat. There is a pretty large group today, so we won't be allowing everyone to unmute, but please put your questions in the chat and I will voice them on your behalf. So the first one that did come in was actually quite interesting. Um, there has been a rather disturbing attempt in mostly Southern states to have certain books banned in school libraries. Has this ever happened to any of your books? Oh yes, I've been I've been banned probably eight, 10, 12 of my books have been banned here and there, not you know all over the world, but here and there. Uh, I don't even remember the titles. But yes, I, uh, it seems that when a book is uncomfortable or has sadness in it, that there will be an attempt to ban it and the attempt will almost always be about language, even if language is not actually there. Mm. Yeah, it, it's, in, it's interesting, banning books often has a, 
interesting counter effect in that banned books there then become more popular amongst other yes. leaderships. So it's a it's an interesting and sensitive issue, but it's uh, I guess a few of your titles have come under under the black bar. Um, another question from the crowd comes back to Victorian clothing that you were just talking about. What are your sources for information or inspiration for Victorian women's clothing and for Enola? Uh, several books, but mainly the internet. But I did get a lot of uh, coloring books, uh, Victorian clothing, costume coloring books, again from Dover Publications. And by coloring the books, I became intimately acquainted. I, I had to internalize everything. So I used coloring books a lot because the in information sinks in that way as you're trying to figure out what color to the dresses. Yes, I completely understand being a when I do art myself, it's usually pen and ink and color, watercolors. And I, so I understand the use of color. There's actually a related question here. Um, you often, or you share paintings on social media, much to the delight of your fans. Is this another form of play or a personal passion for you, both? Uh, it's a personal passion. My mother was an artist. There were art books in the house when I was growing up. And I, but it's also, I'm, uh, it's part of my duty, so to speak, to my publisher and my, my fans to be on social media, to be available. But I'm not a contentious person. I don't want to talk about politics. I don't want to root for causes, even though I am very conscious of uh, things that need to be done in this world. I don't want to make a face of myself. So, so I, I post art which I love. It's a great unifier as well. It's accessible and people can interpret it subjectively and still find value. To I love it when work. people comment. I just love it. And mm -hmm. some of the comments are so far out yet they're so wonderful. Yes. And I, while you and, Nat and uh, Natalie were having your conversation, there was a pretty healthy reaction in the chat as well, all positive. And a lot of it really lovely responses to the proximity of toys and expandable toys to writing poetry. So there's <laughs> appreciation of the play of your creative methods in our chat today. So thank you everyone for those comments too. Another one about Mycroft actually, who's a lesser figure, I think of the two brothers. Um, one guest wonders if, Mycroft will appear in future books and if there will be more funny moments like when he ended up in a veil or kicked in the shins and this is from <laughs> Tennis who is aged nine. Well the, the whole now that uh, Enola is on good terms with her brothers and now that she's no longer evading them I don't think she's going to kick Mycroft in the shins anymore. But, but what if he really deserves it? Well, no, I just, I just feel that we're going to be more polite from here on. I mean, that was, that was purely self-defense. That, that wasn't just a, an act of spleen. <laughs> so, but uh, I would like to get Mycroft back in. I did feel that they treated Mycroft rather badly in the movie, that, uh, that he is not nearly as negative as they made him. Though I, I understand you're making a movie, you got to have a bad guy here. But uh, I'd rather get back closer to the canon and treat him as he is worth. Yes, he was very tightly wound, to put it politely, in the <laughs> film. Um, so uh, there's a couple of questions here about your writing process. So maybe I'll launch the first one. Um, about your writing habits, do you set daily goals of words per day? Or do you write every day of the week? Just tell us a little bit about your, your habits as a writer. I, 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 it's not so much a habit as a compulsion. Uh, I do write every day of the week. I discovered uh, at, when I was very much a beginner, I was married, I had small children and I would write when I could. But for the sake of my mental health, I made a decision that I was going to write first and every, everybody else could just, you know, wait their turn. So I then took up a, when my kids were young again, or when they were school age, I took up a posture of not getting out of bed until everybody was out of the house. And then I would not change into actual clothing. I would stay in my pajamas, 
with a bathrobe if necessary. And if anybody wanted anything, I was not dressed yet. And that's how I think all of us have coped with COVID. So you were well equipped. You had these habits in place. Yes. And I still write first thing every morning. Um, and blessedly, I have a husband who sleeps in. <laughs> so that's my quiet time. I get up a couple of hours before he does and, and I write. And that's uh, if, if, I, if there's a day when I don't get to write, it makes me grumpy. It's, uh, it's, my, it's my emotional life or a part of my emotional life anyway. Do you have any advice specifically for young writers as so they are starting out? I would say go to workshops and take classes and all the rest of it, but don't take anything too seriously. People get all tensed up and they've got rows of editors on their shoulders, especially in workshops. The people doing the workshops don't know any more than you do. What you're doing there is figuring out for yourself what makes you special. When you disagree with how somebody else handles dialogue, maybe you don't necessarily tell them, but you have figured out for yourself how you would prefer to handle dialogue. When I was going to such groups back in uh, when my first few books were published, uh, questions that, I, that came up in the group forced me to figure out what I was about as a writer, that I was more about economy and getting places than I was about fancy, fancy doodads, that I was more about clarity than about say, uh, what, what did they call that? What the, this is what I think down it goes, you know, and it, you end up with a mishmash, that I disliked dream scenes, that I didn't want people looking in the mirror and telling me what they looked like, the characters, the main characters, that, uh, all sorts of little decisions that you make for yourself as to what makes you a writer and what your ideas of writing are come out of those workshops, but they don't come from the other people. They come from within yourself in answer to questions raised by the other people. Excellent advice. It's harder to follow. Know yourself, <laughs> get to know yourself. That's yeah. a tough one to do. And I think we all work on it lifelong. Um, in your Bible that you so uh, as you called it um that's quite a fascinating object and I echo Natalie and I don't know if you Chris put a comment in the chat saying we give tax receipts for donations um so if you ever <laughs> need a home for that in the future consider consider some sympathetic uh, collectors in Canada um but that Bible it, um do you work from that as a source of information or sorry inspiration or is it essentially do you outline your stories or in your conversation just earlier it's, at the beginning, you said Enola sort of drove her character arc. Um, yeah, she, yeah. Uh, uh, it's always a very good thing when the, when the character stands up and talks back and doesn't let you do what you want. It's a very good thing. Um, that Bible consists of notes from research, but also pages on which I brainstorm ideas uh, there's no actual writing in there. It's just a whole a mishmash of thoughts and ideas and notes, mostly research notes. And I, I do refer back to it often, uh, trying to track down something that I learned, but I can't remember exactly what it said. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm doing like two, three things at any given time. I'm looking in the notebook. I'm looking for synonyms on the internet. But I've, I've discovered that the internet is not very good for Victorian synonyms, and I've had to go back to my old thesaurus. Mm. And uh, I am uh, looking on the internet for ideas about, about what women wore in the year 1890, you know, exactly. And what do yes. they call things and so forth. Well, if, if ever we can be of assistance, please send your queries to Rare Books Librarians at McGill. We'd be happy to help dig up some primary sources for you. I have one question personally that I'd like to ask. Um, we are running short on time, so this might be the last one. There are so many wonderful and uplifting comments in the chat. I can share with some of them with you after the fact. Um, we'll okay. There's great praise and 
wonderful program. Someone has called you a bright light in the literature world, oh, um, wow. <laughs> right? High praise. Um, but I wanted to ask specifically the book that came out this last year, Enola Holmes and the Black Barouche, opens with a prologue, an introduction from Sherlock Holmes. It's written in his voice. And I think that's the first time in the series that you've done that. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you wanted to explain a little bit why you chose to, to open the Enola Holmes story with her brother's voice. Well, the editor asked me to do something about filling in the readers on what had happened before. Uh, often what seem, seem like very uh, arcane things are simply a matter of the editor wanted. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I said I could do that in Sherlock Holmes' voice, and it was a bit of a challenge, and I loved it, and I did. There you go. And the casting uh, of Sherlock in the Enola Holmes movie was it was very fun and I enjoyed it. Um, there's been so many people. Him. Sorry, go ahead. I got to meet him. I got to go to England. I met okay. Millie. I met Hen Henry. Oh, yeah. Oh, what fun. I mean, there have been many people who played Sherlock over the years and many that indeed. Was, a, was a new iteration. So I wanna take this moment to say an enormous thank you to you, Nancy, for such an interesting conversation. To, so thank you on behalf of everyone in the crowd, your readers, young and old. Thank you for sharing your creative process with us. And You're thank very you. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks again to Natalie for facilitating this and for kind of opening up the possibilities of this event through her research into ciphers and her and mine shared enthusiasm for audiobooks and ebooks generally. I'm going to put up a screen share once again just to say we are currently closed to the public, but um, we do have e-resources available, so if you are interested in listening to or reading any of Nancy's books, you can pick them up at booksellers, they're available everywhere, or you can borrow some of these titles from the McGill Library as well. So I want to say thank you to Nancy for creating a fun series of books for a great conversation. And I want to say thank you to the people behind the scenes who are helping with today's event. Michelle McLeod is helping out on the Zoom platform for technical assistance. I thank you to Christopher Lyons for the platform, uh, the introduction to Sherlock Holmes content here, and an invitation to explore the Victorian period through our collections and through the, the Holmesian content that we have here. I want to say also a big thank you to our supporters. Um, these po events are possible because we have the support of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council that funds our activities and our outreach programming. Um, so a big thank you to them and to private donors, Rowan Harvey and Doug Bagley, who support the events as well. Our next event you see on screen here is January 20th. We hope to see you all there. And just once again, a big thank you and a welcome to 2022 <laughs> from Roar. So thanks again, everyone. And good afternoon. And a big round of applause, I'll say. There we go. Bye-bye.